what's your prized possession? As we go through 1 Peter, verses 10 through 12, I want you to think about what is your prized possession. Now, a lot of you just, boom, something popped up in your head, just boom, that quick, you know, really fast. It might be an item, uh, it might be some person, you know, or it might be something, you know, whatever it is. How, How did you get it? How did you get that prized possession? How did you win it? Why were you the one that, that chose it? You know, How did it come all about? And, and what's it worth to you? Is it worth a lot to you? Is it worth little? Is, is it your prized possession? There's a very successful lawyer who was parked in his brand new Lexus in front of his office. He's ready to show off his brand new Lexus to his colleagues. And as he opened up the door... A car came speeding by and whacked the door right off of the hinges. He jumped down. He's looking around and he's just like, what is going on here? He, and he's just looking around. There's a police officer who saw the whole thing. He comes up with the sirens and so forth. He jumps out and says, sir, are you okay? I can't believe this. I just bought this Lexus. It was my prized possession. I've worked all this hard. I'm going to show the guys what, I, what possession it was and how great it was and, and, and the success that I've had and all of this stuff. Just, I can't believe the guy just through my whole door. There's no body shop that will be able to fix this thing. It's not going to look the same. It's not going to work the same. The whole bit of the officer just shaking and said, I just can't believe you lawyers. Can't believe you lawyers at all. It just amazes me how you're so worried about your Lexus and you haven't even looked at your arm that isn't even there. And the guy looked down and says, oh, my arm. And he starts going off about his arm. And what is your price possession? <laughs> You know, is it your Lexus? Is it your material? Is it life? You know, uh, we have it wrong, don't we, if it's materialism. Well, you and I have a salvation that is beyond worth. And we received it. How did we get it? How did we choose it? And is it our prized possession? Do we value it? Do you have a possession that nobody sees? It's just you. Is this a type of salvation that you have, a salvation that only you have and you're not going to share with anybody else? Because if you have a prized possession, you're going to share that prized possession with others. It's not just yours, but it can be everyone else's prized possession too. And it is worth a lot. It costs a lot. It costs the life of Jesus Christ on the cross so that you could have eternal life. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Last week we ended in verse... Verse 9, where Peter said, receiving the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. And he talked about how precious a salvation it was, that it was more precious than gold. Uh, Did you know that the oceans, they say, has about $10 billion worth of gold in it? If you can find it. Uh, Good luck panning for gold in the middle of the ocean, but it's $10 billion worth of gold in the ocean. And yet our salvation, our faith is far more valuable than gold, Peter said. And so receiving the end of our faith, and we haven't received that end yet, is coming in the future when we finally get to heaven, as Pastor Chuck is already there in the presence of his Savior, and then the salvation of our souls will be received. Well, today we look at verses 10 through 12. This salvation by grace was prophesied by the Old Testament saints, preached by the new, and received by you and I. And we're going to talk about this Old Testament saints and how they had preached this salvation, but totally didn't understand it, yet they preached it. It was prophesied through them. God gave them the words and the prophecies to proclaim them to the children of Israel. That a Messiah was coming. That he would die for the sins of the world. He would take care of everything. They didn't understand it. They didn't know how it worked. But yet they preached it. And how the New Testament apostles received that same truth of the Old Testament and through Jesus Christ. Understanding what Jesus, the fulfillment of all those prophecies through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection, and believed it and began to preach it to the world. And here we are today and we receive it so easily, so quickly, so readily, and yet we struggle with preaching it to the world. How precious a salvation that we have. So let's look at the Old Testament saints for knowledge of our salvation. Now they had foreknowledge of it, though they did not fully comprehend 
what encompassed grace, salvation, receiving it through our hearts. And not by law, but by God's merciful, pitiful love for us. Uncomprehendable. It says in verse 1, or verse 10, I'm sorry. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Let's stop there for a second. The word inquire and search are similar, but they're different. They inquired of this salvation, of this grace that we have received. Now, Peter, remember, is talking to those that were dispersed. They're in Turkey. And they're under persecution. They're suffering. And he's encouraging them that they're saved and their salvation is coming. So hang on. Yeah, they might die. They, they might suffer. They might have to endure through life and struggles, financial difficulties, relationships and all of those things that life brings about. But hang on, because salvation is coming. And so he's saying that salvation, the prophets inquire to and they search carefully now, the word inquired to means to search or actually to investigate and to explore it. So these Old Testament prophets looked at our salvation. Of course, they were in the past and they began to investigate into it. They spent time. They spent time looking at the prophecies, looking at the Old Testament word of God from the first five book of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then you have the historical books from from Ruth and all the way to the Kings and Chronicles. And then you have the 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 prophetic books or the um, poems like Psalms, Ecclesiastics, and then the major prophets and the minor prophets. They studied it all. What is this salvation? They investigated. They took from here and over here. They looked at it as though they went under a microscope. This is amazing. I don't understand what what they're talking about. I understand it's coming. I understand something great, but I don't get how it's going to take place. They had no concept of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. They had no concept of how he'd enter into Jerusalem. They had no concept that he would have to suffer and that sins would be laid upon him. And then the third day would resurrect from the dead. They didn't understand any of that. And how it would come about. A prophet was one that that uh, proclaimed God's word in the Old Testament. God would give them a word to share with the people. And there were good prophets and there were bad prophets. They even had a school of prophets. And they had prophets for prophets. Because the prophets were not great prophets. And the good prophets had to tell the bad prophets to get in line or God was going to take care of them. So they prophesied the word of God. And these were the ones that were looking into our great salvation. Second Peter one twenty one says, Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. These men didn't write these things down on their own accord, on their own wisdom, their own understanding. No, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's as though they made a choice to write a letter And then as they began to write, the Holy Spirit took over and they began to write what the Holy Spirit directed them into writing to the various churches in the New Testament, to the various people and times and places in the Old Testament. It was the Holy Spirit leading and guiding them. And as they were writing, they did not understand what they were writing. And so they eagerly grasped to try to understand the full meaning of our salvation just like we try to grasp the full meaning of the of the second coming of christ or the rapture and what does that mean the rapture i mean we know well somehow we're going to be lifted up but how are we going to lift, be lifted up and there's controversy are, will our clothes stay here you know some movies you see and their clothes are nicely little folded up you know and the shirts are all nice others there's nothing they're gone so their clothes are with them we don't know it doesn't say do we immediately get into our new bodies or our spirits fall? Do our bodies stay? You know, there's a lot of questions on these issues that the Bible doesn't really tell us. And so we're looking into them. Theologians look into it. Bible teachers and commentators, they all give you their information and what they feel and what they see and so forth. And we look into this rapture, into this second coming, but we really don't understand it, do we? In fact, I would uh, venture to say we don't even understand our salvation, our own salvation, how great it is. That God would save someone like me. Some of us think that we're worth saving. (laughs) Which is interesting, right? I mean, that's how our society is. 
You know, the culture tells us you have to understand you're worth something. You have value. You know, you're, you should have self-esteem. And so when you go somewhere, you go believing that you are the right person to do that job or to take that information or to advance or to build an empire because you know what you're doing. I mean, I've been to, to classes where, where they tell you, look in the mirror and just say, you're a success, you're a success, you're a success, and just re- keep repeating it all day long. And you know what happens? You become a success. Is that true? No, because I've done that and didn't help very much. A success in what? And that's really the question. You know, now I'm not saying because the Bible does teach you are valuable, aren't you? You are so valuable to the, to the Lord, to God. He loves you so much. That he would send his only son to die on the cross for you. So there are a lot of things we don't grasp. I like what, I like what the commentator Clark said. The incarnation and suffering of Jesus Christ and the redemption procured by him for mankind were made known in a general way by the prophets. But they themselves did not know that that time or the time when these things were to take place, nor the people among or by whom he was to suffer, etc., etc. They therefore inquired accurately or earnestly and searched diligently, inquiring of others who were then under the same inspiration and carefully searching the writings of those who had before their time spoke of these things. I mean, they wanted to know what it was all about. You have a unique relationship with God that they did not have. In the Old Testament, their relationship was based upon the law. They had to follow the law. And if they didn't follow the law, they were judged. If you broke the law, you were judged. You know how to get rid of rebelliousness within children? Take a few children out to a gate in the Old Testament. Get them stoned in front of the community. And guess what? Children start obeying. They'll start obeying. Oh, that's kind of cruel. Is it? Do you think it's cruel for children to scream and yell at parents? Do you think it's cruel for children to cuss and swear at them? To be disobedient? Yeah, I think that's cruel too. Well, but they're expressing themselves. Yeah, right. Let me take you to the gate. And start thinking right. That's what they did in the Old Testament. You were under the law. You were under the law. And if you broke the law, then you were condemned by the law. Now, in the Old Testament though, Salvation was was based upon the future. They believed in what God was going to do. And so they put their faith and trust in that lamb and what it pointed to. So when they offered up the lamb, they knew this lamb being offered up. It's a sacrifice. It takes away our sins somehow. Who's it pointing to? And when is that going to happen? And how is it going to happen? It was confusing to them. But they believed God's word, though they did not understand it. When we think about the Old Testament and compare it with the new, we realize that God loves me, you, no less. No less if we were to sin and no more if we were to work until our hands bleed. It's amazing. God doesn't love you any less if you continue to sin and sin worse. His love is there beyond measure. And yet, if you think that you're working and working until your hands are bleeding, that will allow God to love you more, you're wrong. God doesn't love you anymore. He loves us completely right now where we're at. That's how much love He has for us. And that's part of salvation. Because it was His love for you that He sent His Son to die on the cross for you. Our salvation is beyond understanding. Now, that's interesting because... How many times have you heard someone say, well, here, here I got saved. I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart. I believe that he's my savior now and now I want to make him my Lord. But I don't know how to share my faith. I don't understand all that. Share what you do understand. Didn't stop the prophets from sharing. Didn't stop the prophets from writing. Though they did not understand it completely, they still shared it. Do the same thing. Share your faith. Let people know. I don't understand how it all works. I just know I have this peace. I just know I have this rest. And you need it too because I know you don't have rest. You don't have peace. You need the Lord in your life. How does He come in my life? I don't know. I just accepted Him, but He's there. I just know it. Yeah, but how do you know? Come to church and we'll learn together and we will grow together and we'll understand it. But I don't think we'll ever understand how it all works. All I know is it works and it changes us and it puts us on a different path and a better life. How's your life now? Well, not too good. Yeah, see? So let's try this and see what happens. Though I don't understand it all, 
Yet God can do something through it all. So we don't have to understand everything. There's a lot of stuff that I don't understand. And I'm just the you know, pastor in Mariloma compared to a theologian that goes you know, before world leaders. And yet they will willingly admit that they don't understand everything. It was amazing because I was listening to one of the guys. And I mean, these guys are so intellectual. Sometimes some of the stuff they say just, like, okay, I, I don't know what he said, but it must have been good. People are clapping and I'm just kind of looking around. You know. But he talked about politics. And that was one of the things that he uh, said that we've, we've got backwards. And I agree with him 100%. And I've always believed this. He said, politics are downstream from the kingdom. And I thought, exactly. Because the church is putting so much emphasis on politics right now and changing this world politically and, and so forth. You can't do that without the gospel, without a changed heart. Yeah, it may, it, it may slow things down a little bit, but the more people you have, the worse it's going to get. We were talking last night about the population. Uh, Moses was telling me about Harvest, one of the teachers, saying the population of, of during the time of uh, the flood, they estimate at 10 billion people. 10 billion, that's a lot of people. We're at 6 billion worldwide. Uh, 60 million, I believe, in the United States. They're saying, I guess, that within so many years, we can get to 10 billion people. Do you know what happens with the more people you have? The more problems you have the more opinions you have, the more secular cultural ideas that take place. And that's what's happening today. The world is doing what's right in their own eyes, just like the times of, of Noah. And God wiped the whole world out, except for Noah and his family. And it's getting to that point again. Political stuff is downstream from the kingdom. First should come the kingdom and us reaching the kingdom. Right where we're at in Mariloma and with the community that we're in within the city limits and within the police force and with the city council, we should be reaching them. In fact, there are city council members. I know of at least two that are born again believers, one that goes to Harvest and one that goes to a church here in Eastvale. And yet I don't hear or see their faith being lived out, though I know that they make decisions based upon their faith. We need to stand up and take those places. You could be a city council member. You live in Harupa Valley. Young lady, young man, you could do it. And you could change things in this community for the better and start a revival. But it comes from sharing the gospel first. Our salvation is beyond understanding and it is amazing. And it's what's really tragic, and I mentioned it earlier, is that we show more excitement for obtaining material wealth than spiritual treasures, don't we? We really do. I, I offended someone years ago, ten, tens of years ago. They had bought a, a, a brand new car and they came here and, and they were just so excited about this car. And me not being very tactful back then, I'm like, it's going to burn. <laughs> it's going to burn, you know? I mean, it's a car. You should be rejoicing. I mean, they were so excited. It's just like their, their whole demeanor, their face, everything changed. I said, hey, that's a material thing. It's going to burn. I mean, a beautiful car. Thank God you have it. Praise God, you know, and all that. But they were so excited about the car. And we get so excited over material things than we do about the Lord and salvation. When was the last time that you saw someone got saved and you got excited about that? Huh? Several people last week were saved here. You know, and we gave them some... Some new believer packets and stuff. But when did you go up and say, wow, praise God, you got saved. Amazing. Do you know how difficult and hard that is? And yet you gave your heart to them. That's encouraging. That's encouraging to people. We need to really stop being materialistic. If we're, if we're going to change this world, we've got to get rid of the materialisticism. We really have to. And start focusing on the spiritual aspect of life. And be content, like Paul said, with the things that we have now. And then use the things that we have now for the kingdom of God. That's the only way you're going to find peace and rest. And so the next statement, he says, these prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. That grace, unmerited favor, as Chuck would say, that his, his uh, um, counselor said at a youth retreat camp that 
that um, it's you only have one life to live and soon to pass, and only what you do for Christ will last. That's grace. You know, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace, that he gives us the grace to serve him completely. And so the Old Testament prophets prophesied of that grace that was coming through Jesus Christ, but did not understand it. Verse 11, it says, searched what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. What? <laughs> He kind of said it the way I said it earlier, you know, Peter. But Peter is saying they searched these things. What manner of it? Grace, unmerited favor. What is that? You know, and the time, when's it coming? And through the spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, the spirit fell upon them and gave them prophecy, gave them understanding. The spirit did not indwell them in the Old Testament. We have a unique salvation. The Spirit indwells us. He comes and lives inside of us. And He gives us illumination to all truth through the Spirit of God, the comforter and teacher of all things. That's amazing. How'd you like to have a professor at your side every day going to school? That'd be pretty good, huh? Go sit in the classroom and they're asking you questions like, I don't get that professor. Here's a, oh, hey, I got the answer. You know, that'd be pretty cool. We have the Holy Spirit. And if we go and search and, and, and read the scriptures, he will direct us to all truth. He'll guide us and lead us and he'll give us understanding if that is something that he knows that will help in our relationship with him. Let me give you an example of this. When you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it's the first prophecy ever spoken of Jesus Christ. People miss this when they first read it. I know I did it the first few times. But you go back and you look at it and you go, what is he talking about? Because in Genesis, he says concerning the curse, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, you think that he's talking about the woman, that is Eve, and the serpent, because he's relating to that situation, that scenario that took place with them. Then he says, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You're going, what is he talking about? You're, you're a Jewish man. You're reading this and you're like, bruise his head, <coughs> bruise his heel. The serpent and Eve's children are snakes going to be chasing them down the street or what? And biting their heels? And they're going to be crushing snakes all the time? What are they talking about? I have no understanding, no concept. But then when you go to the New Testament and you read what happens, uh, Paul said in Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time has come, when understanding has come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman under the law. And it is Jesus Christ who would crush the serpent's head upon the cross. Though the serpent thought he had him by bruising his heel, he didn't. We live in that, that frame right there. The bruising of the heel and the crushing of the head. And many of us are bruised because we allow Satan to bruise us. They bite our heels. And so we feel defeated, but we don't realize that his head's been crushed. And we need to live that way. We need to live that way. So M Moses writes about Christ here. Before Christ was even thought of. Before the crucifixion was even thought of. Before there was a Roman Empire. Before there was a civilization like that. Because they didn't know any of that. And we see the picture of the cross. When you read Psalms 22, hundreds of years earlier, read it. I, I, homework, okay? Go home and read Psalms 22. You see the cross. You see the crucifixion completely. They were, can you imagine writing this down and going, what is this? <laughs> what are they going to do? I don't understand what any of this is about. You know, the garments before his feet being lots thrown, you know, the, the crucifixion, the hyssop and all these things that the psalmist wrote about. Like, what are they talking about? They couldn't see the full picture of Christ on the cross taking away the sins of the world, the glory that would come. Then we come to verse 12. To them it was revealed that not to themselves. So, it was revealed to them, but it wasn't for them at that time. 
so they didn't get it. Who's it for? For us. For us to understand. Look what he, what he says. But to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Boy, there's a lot right here. Reported, that is, announced or to be made known. The apostles or the disciples began to make known why Jesus came. There were many people who lived at that time who weren't in Jerusalem, who didn't see the crucifixion. And Paul and Peter and John and the disciples were sharing with them. Did you hear what happened in Jerusalem? We heard something. What, it, what happened there? And they began to share with them Jesus Christ and how he fulfilled the Old Testament. Remember when Jesus, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead and he's walking with two disciples on the road of Emmaus. And it says that he opened up their understanding from Genesis all the way up to date as to what was happening at that time. And that's what the disciples were doing to the rest of the world. Through what? Through those who have preached the gospel. That is messengers. You and I are messengers and we're to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> The things proclaimed by the prophets were reported as fact by the apostles. This evidence that the Bible is God's word flows from the Old Testament right into the New Testament. It's so easily connected. They're not two separate books. You read Genesis, you read Psalms 22, and it connects right into the New Testament. It's evidence that the word of God is true and that it's one continuous story. In fact, it's history. It's his story, history. It's about Jesus Christ completely. If you have found salvation to be real in your life, you have an opportunity to preach it. If it's real to you and you've accepted it and it's changed your life, then you have a responsibility to preach it, to share it with others around you that have no understanding. Look for those opportunities. Now, the next statement is fascinating. This one just blew me away. We've all heard it before, how angels are always looking into our affairs. You know how people say, stay out of my business? Well, angels don't stay out of your business. They're always in your business. Notice what Peter says. Things which angels desire to look into. Interesting. Things of salvation, right? What Peter's talking about. The word desire to look into means that they literally are stooping down, looking at what's going on with us in our salvation. Can you imagine a host in heaven of angels watching you every day in your salvation and what you do with it? That's interesting. So you know, I'm scared now. <laughs> you just freaked me out. <laughs> it's interesting. You know, angels... Uh, there's like 93 times that the word angel is used in the New Testament. Actually, the whole Bible. Matthew uses it 13 times. Mark 5, Luke 9, John 2, the, the epistles, you know, one or two times. Hebrews 12 times. Revelation 24 times. Peter uses it uh, two times in both First and Second Peter. So angels play an active part in our lives and in this world. One, one uh, translator says, into which things the angels have passionate desire to look into carefully. They literally have a passion for you and your salvation. They don't fully understand. Remember now, angels were created. They were created. And you know they were created with free will. Oh, here's another Calvinistic thing. They weren't elected to serve God for eternity. They were created with free will. Because a third of them, what, decided to leave heaven. Lucifer took a third of the angels and they freely decided to leave the Lord and battle against him, their choice. So don't tell me there's no free will. There is free will. And if God gave free will to angels, he's given us free will because the Bible teaches that we have free will also. We have free will to choose him or we have free will to reject him. We have free will to be rejoicing in him and we have free will to just Look at life in a gloomy way all day long if that's what you want to do and live like. We have free will. The angels had free will. These angels stuck around and said, this salvation, this is interesting. Because they look at your lives. They looked at my life and they go, this Reuben guy, ooh, he's trouble. 
<laughs> it's like, oh, we see what he's done and what he's doing and how he's doing it. You know, I know you sent your son to die on the cross, but I don't think it's going to him. I mean, this guy's bad, you know. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, look, he's turning the radio on. Why would he do that? What caused him to do that? What made him change? He's listening to Christian radio. Why would he listen to Christian radio? Is it that bad that he's turning to God now? What is going on here? You know, and, and you can almost imagine them now fighting with other demons as they're coming and says, no, he's not going to do that. And then you know, there's a big battle over the soul of one individual. They're passionately looking into things. It's interesting if you look here on the screen, you have a picture of the cherubs over the Ark of the Covenant. What are the cherubs doing? In most pictures you find, and most commentators will say the cherubs were over the Ark of the Covenant, which is the mercy seat, where the sacrifice would be offered up in the Holy of Holies. And what are the angels doing? They're looking over the mercy seat. They're looking down at it. They're observing salvation. They're passionately looking at this work that God is doing on the cross. They don't understand it, but they're hovered over it. When I was in Israel, uh, they had a, a, a fake tabernacle out in the desert and so i got to go out to see it <clears throat> and they, it, it looked authentic as far as they, the scriptures were concerned they tried to do it the best they could so you can walk in you would see the brazen altar you see the the areas where they would uh, uh sacrifice the lambs and the blood would flow into a cup and they you know offered it up on the brazen altar and so forth and then you see the holy of holies you could walk in there and you see the candles of bread and so forth and there was a curtain and they wouldn't allow you to go through that curtain they wouldn't allow you to go through because they still felt like that represented the Holy of Holies. And so no one's allowed in there. And inside there they have the Ark of the Covenant, a replica of it with cherubs overviewing it. What they have done is they allowed you to go back on the outside, come around the building, and there's a little window. And they have a cover over it. And they allow one person to open up and just look in real quick and then close it down. So that you're not in there, but you can see it. And that's what you see when you look in there. The angels are looking at the mercy seat of God where salvation is represented. It's a type of salvation where the blood of the Lamb would be poured. Amazing what the angels are doing in heaven. Paul mentions angels. Since we know that angels view our conduct, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, I think, I think that God has displayed us, Paul says, the apostles last to, as men condemned to death, for we have been made a spectacle to the world and both to angels and men. Angels are looking at us and what we do. So it's very important that we as Christians conduct ourselves properly because angels are watching us. They're watching us. Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 11.10. Write this down. This is so important. This is so important. Because there's such a struggle here. The enemy has grabbed hold of this truth and so manipulated it because of our culture, because of movements in our nation and so forth. And this is so clear. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.10, For this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. And then he says, because of the angels. That is so interesting. That is so interesting. Because of the angels, a woman in the New Testament times was to have a covering over their head. Now, you could look at it and say, well, so we're to wear coverings? That's not what Paul's talking about. There's a spiritual truth here. Okay? Again, to have a symbol of authority. A symbol of authority. It's a symbol of authority. So this covering, because of the angels. Well, let's go back. In verse 11, I'm sorry, in chapter 11, it says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is in the image and the glory of God. But woman is, is the glory of man. Who was created first? Adam. God created him. And how was woman created? Out of man. Who came second? Now, see, when I say that right away, you ladies think so you're saying I'm second. That's not what I said. It's not what I said. The fact is she came second and she came from man. She is the glory of man. Man is the glory of God. 
That's the truth. But woman is the glory of man, for man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Is that true? The woman was created for the man to be a helpmate. The Bible's real clear. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Because of the angels, though. It's like he's writing all this and he says, now because of the angels. Is he writing this for us or for the angels? Who rebelled in heaven? The angels. Who decided to say, we don't need you, God. We're like you. We will become like you and took off the angels. The author is telling the angels to see what it means to be under authority. That you can have a free will and freely fulfill your place and position that God has given you. Why do you create me a woman? I don't know. You have to ask him. (laughs) Why do you create me a man? Sometimes I wish I was a woman. (laughs) It'd be a lot easier than being a man. From my perspective and making all these decisions and choices and and they're wrong. You know, it's a lot easier just to say, okay, yeah, let's just do that. You're responsible, not me. But he's doing it because of the angels. I find that so interesting find that so interesting. He established an order there. See, God has established an order of authority. The principle of male headship, both in the church and in the home and in the presence of the angels. Genesis tells us that man is in the image of God's glory and woman in the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. We find the second reason is found in in the order of creation. God created Adam first and then gave him the responsibility of Eve. Now, because of the angels, God has established male headship in the church, in the presence of his angels who view our worship services. So. You see the Trinity and the angels have this perfect example of submission and authority, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit who work in perfect unity. And then you see humanity. You have the husband, the wife, and the children. And they are to be in perfect unity, like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the goal. And the angels are viewing the relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and are also viewing us under this authority. I find that so interesting and so clear. And yet it's such a struggle, isn't it, in our society today? Because of our culture. Angels are present in our church. As well as our worship services. And they notice any departure from true order. And apparently angels are offended by that violation of truth. It seems that this passage reminds us that our struggle is far bigger than ourselves. Isn't it? The responsibility we have, not just because of our own desires and wants, but we are an example not only to our children, to our community, to our church, but to angels who are watching us. It's a bigger situation than what we think. God has eternal things to teach the universe about authority, submission, and truth. The universe. Do you know when we get to heaven... When we get to heaven, we'll all be perfectly in unity with God. Because you'll have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You will no longer have marriage. There's no need to show the angels the headship. Because now when we get to heaven, the headship will be there. God. And we'll all be submitted unto the Lord at that time and complete. Stop and think for a moment. That here we find the angels with all of their associated glory and yet Peter says that their eyes are continually fixed on the earth they're fixed on us there is a greater glory yet to be fulfilled and the angels can't cannot wait to witness that glory when we get to heaven they like the prophets of old do not seem to understand in advance Just how these things will all come about. But they're watching and they're waiting. Let me close. 
You and I have a salvation that is beyond worth. It seems that everyone is looking into it besides those around us. But believe it or not, you have neighbors that are looking at you. They're wondering about your salvation. They're asking, why are you so different? Why have you changed? That was a big thing with me. Reuben, you're not the same person anymore. Remember how you used to go and drink? You don't do that anymore. What's wrong with you? Well, I'm a Christian. Oh, okay. You're one of those Jesus freaks, huh? Yeah, I've changed. People are looking at you. Paul says you are our epistles written in your heart, known and read by all men. Second Corinthians 3, 2. God is written in your heart. You have that salvation and people are reading you. More importantly than preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, is living the gospel. Is that you live it out. Do you really believe in your belief? Do you really believe it? Then you should be no different here than you are at home or at work. If you pray here in a community prayer service, then you should pray at work. You should be able to be willing to pray anywhere. Me and Bob were at the gym the other day and he was there. And he was hurting, still hurting, keep him in prayer. I said, let's pray. So here we are in the middle of the gym and we're praying. You know, you should be no difference wherever you're at, if you really believe it, because people are reading you. And now from that, people are looking at, okay, oh, Christians over there. Yeah. But they know now, now more greater responsibility that you have. They're reading you. And so what are they reading really is the question. The Bible is clear that for by grace we've been saved through faith and it's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Amazing gift, isn't it? That God would save a wretch like me. Let's pray.